Hi, it's Mr. Ramage, and this video lesson is going to cover the enlightened rulers of the Age of Reason. And what we want to do is see, were these rulers actually enlightened? Did they make any changes? Did they make a difference? Uh, and if so, what were they? Uh, and this is going to be kind of a quick one. We're not going to spend too much time on it. We're not going to do a super deep dive. We're just going to kind of go through and uh, make a list and see if any of these rulers were actually enlightened at all. So during our study of the Enlightenment, we've talked about the philosophers who are being critical of the leadership, right? So Enlightenment philosophers are pointing out all the things that are happening that are wrong with uh, the current system of government and are making lots of suggestions about what needs to be done or what changes need to be made. Uh, that list would include more freedom for the people, uh, more freedom of speech, of religion, of the press, the right to assemble, and of course the right to own property, which was denied to a vast majority of people. So within most of these countries, we have rulers who would be considered despots, rulers who hold absolute power. And during our study of the Enlightenment, from the beginning of Unit 1, we've talked about uh, the fact that these rulers had a tremendous amount of power, uh, and very few people had very, uh, very few ways to combat that power or very little freedom for themselves. So the enlightened despots are going to be rulers, though, who are sort of sympathetic or empathetic to the needs of the people, maybe perhaps people who were inspired by enlightenment ideas and are going to make reforms to help address the needs of their people. Now, are they all going to be successful? Well, let's see. So I want to start with King Frederick William I of Prussia, uh, who under his leadership, built Prussia into a major European power. So he's going to be an example of somebody who is not very enlightened. He would definitely be an absolute monarch or a despot without the enlightened part. And to kind of show you that, he says in this quote here, one must serve the king with life and limb and surrender everything except salvation. The latter is reserved for God, but everything else must be mine. So this is the type of ruler we're very much accustomed to in Europe in the 15, 16, 1700s, the time period of this Enlightenment movement. So now we're going to get into some Enlightened despots, and we're going to stick with Prussia, and we're going to look at King Frederick II, also known as Frederick the Great, who ruled from 1740 to 1786. And he is going to make a tremendous amount of enlightened reforms. He's going to reform Prussia's judicial system. He is going to abolish torture, which is good. He is going to relax the laws on freedom of speech in the press, not give entirely freedom of speech and freedom of the press to the people, but is going to relax the laws and not enforce them as much. He is going to support religious tolerance within his kingdom. He is going to build up the city of Berlin, uh, building uh, statues and arts and revitalizing the city, building canals, making improvements to the city as a whole. So not only is he enlightened in terms of the political changes, but also the societal changes of transforming his city into a more modern city. Now, some things he does not do, which aren't great. Uh, he did not reform Prussian society. So things are going to be essentially the same as they were. A very strict class system is going to be in place. Uh, and there are still serfs in Prussia, and they are going to be serving these land-owning nobles. And we're going to talk about serfs here in a second. So Frederick II is kind of great, and he does make some changes and reforms, but I don't know how progressive he was. Um, keeping serfs might have been, uh, or getting rid of serfdom might have been a better choice. So let's talk serfs for a minute because we haven't really discussed them in class. Uh, and serfs exist in quite a few countries, especially in Central and Eastern Europe at this time. And serfs were peasant farmers who were legally controlled by a landowner. So they're not slaves per se, uh, but they definitely cannot have their own freedom. So let's learn a little bit more about them here. Uh, serfs worked the land and gave the majority of the harvest to the landowner. So serfs, uh, a small family, would have a, like a small cottage and they would work a plot of land. And at the end of the season or at harvest time, they would go to the landowner with the vast majority of their crops, which then the landowner would turn around and sell and make money. And the serfs can keep some of the food to sell or to trade or to eat. Serfs could not leave the land, marry, or change occupation without permission. So here are some of the legal restrictions on a serf. Uh, you legally could not leave the land. If you did, you could be arrested and brought back. You could not get married without the permission of your landowner. 
uh, and you cannot change your occupation. So if you wanted to, uh, you know, stop working on the farm and go in and learn how to be a blacksmith or to work with glass or something like that, you could not do that without the permission of the person that held your contract. Uh, could be sold with the land to another owner. This is pretty crazy, right? So we're talking about selling people with your land. So if I decided to sell 30 acres of my land to somebody else, I was going to retire and or I was going to leave the country, uh, I could sell the land and I could sell you with it. That would be pretty crazy. Serfs had very, very few legal rights, if hardly any, uh, and they could be given their freedom uh, by, uh, by the landowner who owned them. They could purchase their freedom or they could escape. So serfs and slaves, as we know a lot about American slavery, share some similar characteristics and qualities. The next enlightened despot we're going to look at is Empress Maria Theresa, who is going to rule over Austria uh, from 1740 to 1780. Now, she does not embrace enlightenment ideas. She's actually kind of anti-enlightenment, but she is going to bring two reforms to Austria, which are pretty cool. Uh, number one... Uh, thanks to some developments of the scientific revolution and our better understanding of diseases and germs, uh, we now are developing vaccines for smallpox, which is a tremendous killer of people back in this time period. So she's going to support the inoculation or the vaccination of children against smallpox. So this is the government essentially vaccinating children, which is pretty cool, very progressive for the late 1700s. She's also going to increase access to education and emphasize a more secular education. So, again, we talked about secularism earlier in our unit. Secularism is less religion. Uh, so we're looking at an uh, education that's not based on religious teachings, but rather a more secular education, looking into more science and logic and things like that. But despite these cool things, she censored lots and lots and lots of books. Uh, including those written by Voltaire and Rousseau, two of our prominent Enlightenment writers and thinkers. So while she does not embrace Enlightenment ideas per se, she does make two reforms uh, that are going to benefit her country in terms of the inoculation of children against smallpox and uh, increasing access to education. Now her son, Emperor Joseph II, he is going to go all in on the Enlightenment. And he is going to be co-regent with his mother until she died in 1780. So he was technically the emperor, but he was too young. So his mom sort of ruled until she passed away in 1780. And then uh, Joseph II rules himself. And he said, when he came to power, I have made philosophy the lawmaker of my empire. So the philosophy of the Enlightenment is what he's talking about. And he is going to use the writings and the teachings and the ideas of the Enlightenment to guide his actions as ruler. So he's probably the most enlightened of our despots. And he's going to make many changes based on these Enlightenment ideas. And there's a pretty nice little list here. So he's going to abolish in Austria serfdom. He's going to free the serfs and make them citizens. That's pretty cool. He's going to abolish the death penalty. Very nice. He's going to demand equality of the law for all people, so that the, the law should be applied equally to everybody. Um, he's going to write and pass the Edict of Toleration in 1782, which is going to bring religious freedom to the people in his country. Uh, freedom to the uh, Christian Protestants, to the Orthodox, and to the Jews that are living there, who have been highly persecuted over the last couple of centuries. Uh, and he's going to make education compulsory, so he wants every child in his country to go to school. That is great. Those are some pretty enlightened reforms. The Enlightenment philosophers definitely would be digging what he's talking about. But we've got some problems. Uh, many of these reforms become extremely unpopular amongst the uh, well-to-do people in Austria. Uh, the nobles especially are afraid that all of these changes are too much, too fast, and too radical. And uh, the empire itself, right, it's a pretty vast empire in terms of size and, and the number of people and the types of people. Many people within the empire are going to resist these changes. Even some serfs kind of resisted uh, gaining their freedom, which is kind of strange because, as you'll see, they, they don't really have very many options. Um, newly freed serfs saw little improvement, right? So their lives aren't getting any better. And now that they're no longer serfs, they have to pay taxes. So what very little money they were making working the farmlands, because they're still going to be on the farms, is now going to be paid in taxes. So they're actually losing by being free. Now, these reforms are 
again, they're ambitious, uh, but they're not going to work. And after his death, most of these reforms are going to be undone by the next round of rulers. Okay. Uh, and our uh, next enlightened despot we're going to talk about is from Russia, Empress Catherine II, who ruled uh, from, I'm sorry, who lived from 1762 to 1796. Uh, she was very much involved in the Enlightenment and had pen pal relationships with Voltaire amongst some other Enlightenment philosophers. So she was very much engaged with them and wrote letters back and forth. Okay. Um, she is going to reorganize Russian law by writing the Nakaz, I think that's how you pronounce it, and basically establishing a system of laws that was more consistent and made more sense. Um, so reorganizing and rewriting Russian law so that it was more um, equitable um, and more consistent. Maybe not more beneficial to everybody, but, but definitely more consistent. So she's trying to make things uh, in terms of how the law is applied more equal. She opened schools and she worked to increase literacy in Russia, again, uh, trying to educate the public, providing educational opportunities and systems is important. Those don't really exist in many places, but she does not end serfdom, right? So again, some of these rulers have their limitations with how enlightened they're going to be. Serfdom was a big thing in Russia, and there were a lot of them. There was actually a serf rebellion called the Pugachev Rebellion, which took place in 1773. And afterwards, she actually expanded serfdom uh, and uh, reinstituted many of the laws that were designed to control serfs and maintain them uh, as uh, uh, legally owned uh, workers on the land. So she uh, definitely did not feel the need to uh, free the serfs. So the big question, were they enlightened? Well, I think that some of them were. Some of them had some good ideas, and some of them had some pretty epic failures. Again, we're not doing a super deep dive into these enlightened despots. We're just looking at some of the basics. Uh, we just want to be aware that there were some leaders who did try to make some changes based on the enlightenment. And that's part of our key takeaways. So let's wrap up this video lesson with five things that hopefully you'll take away from it. Number one, enlightened despots were rulers who made changes based on enlightenment ideas. Two, serfs were peasant farmers who were legally tied to the land, and in some places they were freed during this enlightened period, while in others they were not. Uh, number three, some rulers made more changes than others, obviously. Uh, number four, nobles and royalty were fearful of too many changes to the status quo, and change is very hard, and change takes time, and some of these leaders tried to make changes too fast, and it kind of backfired on them. And number five, many changes made by enlightened despots were undone after their rule ended, which meant they probably uh, were not very popular amongst the people who were part of that ruling class within that country. So that's our look at enlightened despots. Hopefully you learned something and hopefully you'll bring it with you to the test.